Today, I've got special permission to visit an aeroplane hangar and look inside a plane. It's a bit like a car park for aeroplanes. And that one is absolutely huge. The area where the passengers sit is called the cabin, and the place where the pilots sit is over there. Come on, let's go take a look. Wow! This is the cockpit, and all of these buttons, dials and lights, they're the instruments that help the pilot to fly the plane. There are so many of them, aren't there? <laughs> this is so exciting. I'm sat in the captain's seat. These levers here are called the thrust levers, and they make the plane go faster or slower. And this here is called the side stick. This turns the plane left or right, up or down. And if the pilot needs to move the plane when it's on the ground or stop it, they'll use these foot pedals down here. It all looks really complicated, doesn't it? To find out how an aeroplane takes off and lands, I think we need a closer look. When the aeroplane is ready to take off, the pilot pushes the thrust levers forward, making the engine speed up. The aeroplane travels faster and faster along the runway. The wings have a special curved shape called an aerofoil. The air that flows over the top of the wing moves faster than the air which moves underneath the wing. And this creates a force called lift. The lift helps the aeroplane up and off the ground. To land the aeroplane, the pilot pushes the side stick forward, which tilts the elevator on the back of the aeroplane down. This makes the nose of the plane point downwards. The pilot moves the thrust levers back. This slows down the engines. Flaps on the wings are then flicked up to slow down the air that's flowing over the wings. The wheels are put into position, and when the plane lands on the runway, the pilot presses the brakes and the plane comes to a stop. This is where pilots come to practice flying aeroplanes. But can you see any aeroplanes? Pilots learn to fly in these pods called flight simulators. They look just like the cockpits on real planes, but these ones are just for practice. Now this is the really fun part. I get to join Bridget, a pilot, and watch her practice at takeoff and landing. <laughs> the windows are actually video screens to show us what flying the plane would look like in real life. OK, Bridget, we're ready for takeoff. The first thing Bridget does is push the thrust levers forward, and that powers the engines, which make the plane move forward and get faster and faster. Here we go. You can hear the engines. We're getting faster and faster, and when the time is right, Bridget pulls back on the side stick, and that lifts the nose of the plane into the air. And here we go. We're taking off into the air. It feels like we're actually flying. I'm wearing my special head camera so you can see what the pilot sees when they're landing a plane. Wow, we are so high up. When the plane is in the sky, Bridget uses the side stick to turn the plane to the left or to the right, up or down. But right now, we're getting ready to land. Here we go. Bridget gently pushes the side stick forward to make the elevator at the back of the plane tilt down, which makes the nose of the plane dip down. The houses on the ground are getting bigger and bigger, which means the plane is getting lower and lower to the ground. Ooh. We're getting closer. 
now Bridget is pulling the thrust lever backwards and that will slow the power to the engines which slows the plane down and then Bridget uses the foot pedals that will break and slow down the plane on the ground. And we've landed. That was brilliant. I loved seeing how an aeroplane takes off and lands. What was your favourite bit about finding out how an aeroplane works? Do you remember what the lever was called that steers the aeroplane? That's right, it's called a side stick. Did you hear the sound in the simulator when the engine started to speed up? And did you see all those buttons and levers in the aeroplane cockpit? The back of the boat is called the stern, and it's where these two engines are. And each engine turns one of these. It's a propeller, and the propeller spins in the water to push the lifeboat along really fast. You should never play near water or boats without a grown-up, but I've got special permission to go on board today. Wow, look! There is lots of equipment to help the lifeboat crew find and rescue people quickly. This is a chart plotter. It's a map of the river. And if you look here, you can see our position just there. And this is a compass. A compass shows the lifeboat which direction they're travelling in. North, south, east or west. Sometimes it can be tricky for the lifeboat crew to spot people in the water, especially if it's at night, so they use a special camera to help them. It sits right up here at the back of the boat. It's called a thermal imaging camera. But how does a thermal imaging camera work? I think we need to take a closer look. When the lifeboat is sent out on a rescue mission, the thermal imaging camera is switched on. The camera measures thermal energy. That's either how hot, like our bodies, or cold, like the sea something is. It can see the thermal energy during the daytime and at night. The camera can be moved up and down, left and right, using a lever called a joystick. The picture from the camera is seen on a screen on board the boat. The hotter something is, the more heat or thermal energy it gives off. Our bodies are warm and give off lots of heat, and the camera will show this as a whitish grey colour. The river water is cold. This camera shows cold as red. So if a person is in trouble in the water, they can be spotted on the thermal camera and the lifeboat crew can rescue them. Well, today, the lifeboat crew are doing a practice rescue and they've given me permission to go with them, but to do that, I have to wear the right safety equipment. Because today is a practice rescue, Paul, one of the lifeboat crew members, is going to go in the water and he's trained to do this. But so that we can see what the rescue looks like from the water, I'm going to put my special camera onto Paul's helmet. If this was a real rescue, the team would get a message from the Coast Guard and quickly get the boat out to sea. It's pushed into the water by a tractor until the water is deep enough to float in. We're on our way to go and find Paul. He's out there somewhere. Look, there's Paul. Can you see him on my special camera? Let's see how quickly the lifeboat crew can find him. using the chart plotter and the compass so that we go in the right direction in the water. And it looks like we're heading east. It is so fast. Can you see the two engines? They blow with the propellers into the water. Woo! We're just spinning around to push the lifeboat along quickly. They're noisy, aren't they? <laughs> controlling the thermal imaging camera at the back of the boat to see if he can find Paul in the water. And this screen is showing us the picture from the camera. The river is so big, 
It's really hard to look for Paul with my own eyes, but the thermal camera can see Paul's warm body. Look, 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 can you see that on the screen? I think I can see something. Looks like a white blob, doesn't it? There he is! We found Paul! Trained to lift people safely and quickly onto the boat. Paul is safely on the boat with the help of special safety equipment. This shipping container is 12 meters long. That's almost as long as a bus. But to move a shipping container this big, we're going to need a shipping crane. And they are huge. Along here, there are 15 shipping cranes and they all help to move the containers off the ship. Look, can you see that? There's one up there. It goes so high up! The cranes grab and lift the containers onto the quayside. Once the shipping containers are on land, these enormous trucks called straddle cars move the containers into this area called the terminal. Just look at it! It's like a giant robot dog! Next, a truck called a reach stacker stores the shipping containers on top of each other. It's like building a tower out of monster stacking bricks. It is busy work. Next, we need to get the containers from the terminal over here to the rail cart that's just over there. But how are we going to do that? We need this, a gantry crane. Let's take a closer look at this one. The gantry crane looks like a bridge sitting on two tracks, like train tracks. This part is called the cross travel lorry. Hanging from the cross travel lorry is the cab. This is where the driver sits. When the driver presses a button in the cab and moves the joystick, the cross-travel lorry will move forwards and backwards along the track. When the driver presses another button, the crane moves across from left to right. Underneath the cross-travel lorry, there is a big metal drum, which has eight steel ropes wrapped around. At the end of the steel ropes, there is a special frame called a spreader, like a big crab paw. The driver unwinds the ropes and lowers the spreader over the shipping container. It fits on perfectly. The driver presses a switch which locks the spreader onto the shipping container to make sure it's safe to move. Then the driver moves a joystick to wind up the steel ropes and the shipping container moves across and along the track. The driver presses another button and the steel ropes unwind. The shipping container is lowered safely onto the rail cart, ready to move onto the next place. That was amazing. I've bought my special camera and I'm going to attach it to this container so we can see what it looks like when this gets lifted from here, the terminal, up and over there to the rail cart. Okay, let's go. Whoa, look at it go up. And I'm going up there to see it all in action. Look, I've also put a special camera in the driver's cab. Can you see how high up he is? It's like the driver's in a fishbowl in the sky, <laughs> looking down at all the containers below. Can you see how the steel ropes are being wound up to lift the container higher and higher? Next, as the driver pushes the joystick forward, 
The container moves forward too, over there onto the rail cart. These containers can weigh about 30 tonnes. That's the same as about 20 family cars, but that's no problem for a gantry crane. Oh. The container is nearly on the rail cart. All it needs to do now is line up the four corner pins of the cart with the pins on the container. And listen carefully. Clunk as the container lands on the cart. Brilliant, the shipping containers are now ready to be delivered across country on the back of a train. I think shipping containers are amazing. What was your favourite bit about seeing how shipping containers work? Can you remember the name of the big trucks that looked like giant robot dogs? They're called straddle cars. Did you like the sound the shipping container made as it fixed onto the rail cart? And did you see how high the shipping container went when it was picked up by the gantry crane? You must never go onto or play near a train track. But this track has been closed and all the trains stopped so I have special permission to go onto the tracks to show you how they work. This part of the track is called a junction, and a junction is where the track splits in two. Can you see there's one going straight up under the bridge and another one going off to the side? To control which route a train will take is this section here called the points. It's a piece of the tracks that can move from one side to another, and they're moved by this. It's called a rod. The rod is connected to this hut, called a signal box, and it's where the signalman controls the tracks. To control the tracks, he moves signals like this, which tell the train driver whether it's safe to go, a bit like traffic lights. But I think we need to take a closer look. the signal box are lots of levers which pull the rods and wires that run alongside the track. First, the signalman pulls the black lever. This changes the points on the track from one side to the other. Then the blue lever is pulled. This stops the points from changing while the train is moving across. Finally, the red lever is pulled. This lowers the signal, which means the train can travel safely ahead. The train driver sees the lowered signal, so can carry on going. On to a different track. It's really clever, isn't it? I'd love to see a junction working, though, would you? Let's go take a look inside this signal box. Wow, look at all of the levers. Can you guess how many there are? There are 37 of them. There are red ones, white ones, black ones, and even blue ones. <laughs> this is Andy, and he's the signalman. And it's Andy's job to pull the right levers at the right time and tell the train drivers when it's safe to go. So how does Andy know which lever to pull when? Up here is a map of the train tracks and it tells Andy which lever controls which point and signal on the tracks. While Andy changes the levers, he's given me permission to go to the closed part of the track to see how he sets a path for the train. Can you see here, this is the rod which is connected to the black lever in the signal box and the rod is connected to the track points. Here, can you see? I wonder what will happen when Andy pulls a lever in the signal box. And because he's so far away, I'm going to talk to Andy using a walkie-talkie radio. OK, here goes. Hello, Andy, this is Maddie. Can you move the points, please? Here we go. That's no problem. I can move the points now. 
Thank you, Andy. Did you see that? That was so exciting. Andy pulled the black lever and the points moved so the train can get onto the right tracks to go in the right direction. Andy, can you pull the blue lever to lock the points, please? I can do that now. Wow, did you see that? Finally, Andy is going to reopen the train tracks so the trains can run again. I need to get safely off the track and onto the footbridge so he can lower the signals. There are two signals, one further up the track and this circular one next to the points. Andy pulls one red lever for each signal. Right, let's see the train drive over the points. Here comes the train! I've put my special camera on the front of the train so we can see exactly how it changes tracks. <gasps> Did you hear that? Wow! There we go! How brilliant was that? The train moved on to the other track. lights are used to control traffic, like cars and buses at junctions. A junction is where two or more roads meet. Here, there's four roads that meet together and lots of different lanes, so it can get quite noisy. Traffic lights are important because they help traffic all travel in different directions through a junction safely. They do that by telling the traffic when to stop and when it's safe to go. Do you know what colour means stop? That's right, it's red. Can you see? The traffic light is red now. But what do you think happens next? It's changing colour. Look, the traffic light turned green. And green means that it's safe to go. And then, off goes the traffic. But did you notice another colour? That's right. In between the red and the green, there's an amber light. The amber light tells you to get ready to stop or get ready to go. So how do the traffic lights change to keep the traffic flowing so that all the cars can get to where they're going? Come with me. This is a traffic control centre, and it's where traffic lights are controlled and monitored in a city centre. Look at all of these screens showing roads and traffic lights and junctions. It's so busy, and there are so many roads. Traffic lights are controlled by computers, and the computer tells each traffic light how long it needs to be red, when to change to amber, and how long it needs to be green. It's called the traffic lights cycle. But what is a traffic light cycle, and how does it work? I think we need to take a closer look. junction, there is a set of traffic lights for each road. The roads coming from the left and right see a red light, so they have to wait. Traffic coming from the top and bottom roads see a green light at the same time. That means it's safe for them to go. The traffic can go straight ahead or can turn left. It can also turn right, but it has to wait until the traffic coming in the opposite direction has passed and it's safe to turn. Next, the lights on the roads going from the top to bottom turn amber, then red to make the traffic stop. Then the cars travelling on the road going across see red and amber, then turn to green, so it's their turn to go. They can now drive straight on, go left or wait to turn right. And the whole cycle starts again to keep the traffic flowing nicely all day long. Wow, it's really clever, isn't it? Shall we see how a junction works from up high? I've got my special steady camera, and a steady camera means that the picture will be smooth and steady even when I put the camera high in the air. <laughs> oh, 
That is so high! <laughs> <laughs> Look at the junction all the way down there. Can you see the traffic moving up and down the road? That's because their traffic light is on green. Ah, now look. The traffic going up and down has now stopped because their traffic light has turned red. So now it's the turn of the traffic going across the junction. That means their light has turned from red to red and amber and then green. Away they go. <laughs> that was brilliant. Now, let's have a go at driving through the junction. First, I'm going to drive straight on across the junction. I've put a special camera on the front of the car so we can see more clearly. The lights have turned red, which means we need to stop. And now the lights are green, which means I can go ahead safely. I'm going to turn left at the junction. The light is green, so I can go. OK, last go. Let's make a right turn. Remember, before turning right, I have to wait until there's no traffic coming from the opposite direction. You mustn't play near boats or water without a grown-up, but I've got special permission to go on board so I can show you how a lock works to get a narrow boat from one level to another. On this part of the canal, there are 30 locks. It's called a flight of locks and it's a bit like a staircase for narrow boats. So they can go up and down the hill. All locks work the same way using gates called lock gates. And this one has one at the top and two at the bottom. And this middle part here is called the chamber. The chamber is very deep. It would be dangerous to get too close to the edge. And it's in the chamber where the narrow boat can travel up or down. But before we jump on board, I think we need to take a closer look at how a lock works. When a narrow boat wants to travel downhill, it reaches the lock gate. In the lock gate below is a little door called a paddle. The paddle is opened by turning a special handle called the windlass. The water from above rushes into the chamber below and it fills up. When the level of the water in the chamber is at the same level as the water above, the lock gates are pushed open using a big arm called a balance beam. The paddles are wound down and the boat glides through into the chamber. And the lock gates are close behind it. Next, the paddle in the lock gate at the other end of the chamber is opened. This makes the water rush out, a bit like going down a plug hole, and the boat gets lower and lower. When the level of the water is at the same on both sides, the balance beam is pushed to open the gate the boat moves through and on its way. Isn't that clever? I'd like to see it all working for real though, would you? This is John and he's our skipper. He's going to be driving the narrow boat through the lock today. First, I'm opening up the paddle, the little trap door at the bottom of the lock gate, which lets the water in. And I'm using the special handle called the windlass. It's actually quite hard work. <laughs> wow! The chamber needs to fill all the way up to the same level as our boat. There we go, the chamber is full of water and you can see it's at the same level as the canal where our narrow boat is, which means we can open the lock gate. It would be really heavy, but actually, I can get a good grip with my feet. Ah, there we go, that's the gate open. Time to get on the boat. I'm 
and being extra careful as boats can be wobbly. Once the boat is in the chamber, the lock gates can be closed. We're nearly ready to go and I'm going to use my special camera on a long pole so that you can come on board and travel down the lock with me. But first, the lock keepers, Steve and Jill, need to open the paddles at this end so that the water in the chamber flows out. Wow! We're actually moving down really quickly. Bye! Whilst we're just going down the lock, let's go to the other end of the boat to see what it looks like from the captain's point of view. Wow! Look at that. Can you see all of the water? At the moment, the water is gushing out of the chamber so that the boat is at the same level over that side. Right, let's go back through. When you're down here and the chamber's empty, you can really see just how enormous the lock gates are. And I can't wait for them to open to reveal a whole new part of the canal. Whoa! The gates are open. We can continue on down the hill. Absolutely brilliant.